Welcome and thank you for attending. All parties are in listen-only mode for the duration of the presentation. Questions may be asked the presenter via the questions pane in the webinar control panel. Today's presentation will be recorded. If you have any objection, you may disconnect at this time. I will now turn the presentation over to your presenter. You may begin. Good afternoon, uh, Sherm Long Island. Um, and if we have anybody from Sherm, New York City joining us, good afternoon. Uh, this is Chris Valentino. And um, today for our last Friday Lunch and Learn, we're gonna spend uh, our 20 minutes talking about the new New York State and um, New York City training initiatives or mandates. The um, big news, it's big news for us in New York. Um, while most employers, at least that I work with, and certainly who have been attending uh, Sherm Long Island breakfast series and dinner meetings, what we've been um, encouraging for the last uh, 30 years um, is that employers go out and do training, um, that we do training for our management teams, that we do training for our employees, uh, specifically EEO compliance training, and under the EEO compliance umbrella, uh, that we do anti-harassment training, which again would include sexual harassment. Um, and after my 18 years of practice, um, I will tell you that I believe that employers uh, are failing even when they do this training uh, because they're approaching it as a check off the box exercise. The um, Every year or every other year, we run people through a training program, whether it be live, whether it be webinar based, whether it be a disc that people need to watch uh, or an online session. And the only thing that we care about is the fact that they completed it and that we, they signed the acknowledgement. Um, and for as long as anybody will have listened to me, uh, I had said, and I still say, you can't treat this like check off the box. You have to treat this as an effort and as an opportunity to build a better workforce, to let your supervisors know that the real goal and the real takeaway from doing anti-harassment or EEO compliance training is not to create a defense for the employer in the event of a lawsuit. The real goal is to have them understand that there are so many things, the disputes that we see in the workplace can be avoided, and there are so many different things that we can do to make sure that we work hard to build a better employee and to avoid those disputes and to create the workplace that people want to work in, not that they have to work in. And that may sound like pie in the sky, but it's absolutely true and it's what I believe. So if you are an employer listening to this live or you'll listen to it, as a recording, you have to understand that even with the mandates that are coming from New York State and New York City, this cannot be a check off the box exercise for you. We have to recognize that currently and always, this has been a major problem. Harassment in the workplace, discrimination, it is an issue, it's a problem. There's nothing new that is emerging out of the Me Too movement. It's all stuff we've seen before. And it is now an opportunity for us to sort of reinvent our approach to, uh, approach to training and to do it in a much more effective way. So while New York State and New York City will require us to do this uh, very soon, um, we should embrace this requirement and say, not only am I gonna check off the box, but I'm gonna make it the very best it can be. Um, and um, with that, let's talk a little bit about uh, the requirements. We're going to start talking about New York City, I'm sorry, New York State, and the measures uh, that are going into effect um, in 2018. First, when we talk about New York State, we have to understand that this is not just a training mandate. There is so much more that we need to know about the New York State enactments that are going to affect everything that we do in, in terms of our day-to-day -day human resources. The first one, 
we need to understand that New York's prohibitions on harassment in the workplace will extend out to individuals who are not your employees. The New York law, this amendment that will go into effect, it goes into effect immediate uh, on the signing of the, uh, the legislation by the governor, which was April 12th, will extend out to your contractors, to your subcontractors, to your vendors, your consultants, or anybody else who is an agent uh, or providing services to your company. Your prohibitions against sexual harassment um, in the workplace will extend out to these non-employees, which means that your policies need to be updated and your training needs to be updated to make sure that people who are in management and supervisory positions understand that when they become aware of anything that is harassing or potentially harassing vis-a-vis these third-party agents of your company, that must be reported to human resources. That is a huge change. Next, in terms of our agreements with employees, I'm going to use, for example, a run-of-the-mill settlement agreement, a release agreement. No longer can we have, and this goes into effect in July of 2018, no longer can we have language in there that prohibits an individual from communicating with outside people outside the agreement about uh, sexual harassment or the facts uh, um, surrounding a sexual harassment circumstance in the workplace. We can no longer have these blanket non-disclosure confidentiality provisions filling up our agreements, specifically our release agreements. Very big change, very big concern, right? Now, what New York State did was said, you can't have these provisions, but in the event the employee chooses to have this provision, um, we will permit, uh, we'll permit it provided that it is the employee's preference. When you read the law, I interpret this as an employee's preference being established by the uh, issuance of 21 days to the employee to consider the agreement and seven days to revoke his or her acceptance of the agreement. That should sound familiar to everybody on this call, right? Those are the OWBPA requirements for a release agreement for somebody who's over the age of 40. So in the event that you are executing a release agreement with somebody who may have uh, filed a um, a sexual harassment complaint or indicated that sexual harassment was uh, present in, during their employment, we need to be thinking 21 and 7 separate and apart from looking at their date of birth. So we're going to need from an HR perspective to be focused on that issue. Um, I think um, an even bigger development uh, centers on the usage of arbitration agreements uh, in the New York workforce in the New York workplace. Uh, again, for anybody who goes to the Jackson Lewis dinner meetings or the breakfast series, uh, you've certainly heard me and my colleagues talk about arbitration agreements being uh, not a bad idea, right? To lock up employees, make sure that we stay out of court, uh, we can avoid jury trials. Um, we've talked about the fact that this summer the Supreme Court should be issuing a determination in a hotly contested uh, arbitration agreement case dealing with a bunch of cases, but one of them is the Murphy Oil uh, National Labor Relations Board decision, which ultimately uh, concluded that arbitration agreements that include class action waivers violate the National Labor Relations Act. I think what you're going to get is a decision from the Supreme Court reaffirming the importance of arbitration agreements. So a lot of employers want these things. They want to implement arbitration agreements with their employees. What New York State is coming out now and saying that effective in July of 2018, uh, all arbitration agreements and arbitration provisions um, that are in place that would preclude somebody from filing a sexual harassment complaint are null and void. That's huge. Everything in existence that applies to a sexual harassment circumstance is null and void, and you cannot enter into one of these going forward. So basically, you have New York State saying, you can't arbitrate. You can't have an arbitration agreement as it relates to sexual harassment disputes in the workplace. There is an exception 
for collective bargaining agreements. Uh, so they will continue to uh, be in effect. And for those people who currently have arbitration provisions or arbitration agreements with employees, the New York State came out and said, in the event that your agreement or this provision of the agreement is null and void, it will not um, uh, void out the rest of your arbitration agreement. So all other disputes uh, outside of sexual harassment uh, are ripe for arbitration. Um, if I'm a betting man, this ultimately will be challenged, and it will be a very interesting challenge given the fact that um, it is, uh, it's, a, it's a really good argument to say that New York State, New York State's law with regard to arbitration and sexual harassment matters should be preempted by the federal law. Um, I, think, I do think that if I was a betting man, I would say that that argument will win. Um, but until such time as that gets litigated, we are going to be dealing with this prohibition on arbitration uh, as it relates to sexual harassment in New York. So really huge change. Um, the, the New York legislation also um, requires or will require uh, specifics uh, in, in terms of the anti-harassment policies that employers uh, currently have in their handbooks uh, and in their workplaces. Um, as of uh, October 8th, our Department of Labor and our Division of Human Rights will be collaborating on uh, a new uh, sexual harassment prevention guidance document and policy. Uh, this is supposed to be a document that every employer will adopt um, so that, uh, and it will have certain inclusions in it uh, so that everybody will be on the same page uh, as it relates to preventing sexual harassment in the workplace. Uh, I can promise you I'm probably not going to want to adopt this. I'm probably going to want to do something different for the clients that I work with. But uh, New York State is saying that's fine. Uh, as long as it meets the requirements of what we've put out, an employer need not adopt the state policy, but, you know, you can stay with your policy. And a lot of these provisions are already in your policies. For example, uh, your policies have the explanation uh, of what sexual harassment is and provides examples of what unlawful sexual harassment looks like in the workplace. Um, the, uh, the New York State requirements will mandate employers uh, put in federal and state statutory provisions and remedies, uh, include a standard complaint form. That's a little bit different. A lot of our policies don't include that form, but um, I don't see that as being uh, a bad thing. Also, um, it will provide procedures for um, people to bring complaints uh, to ensure a due process for all involved. Again, your policies include all of this. Um, what your policies probably don't include, which a lot of states have, like for example, Massachusetts, um, and now New York is adopting, is a recitation in your policy of in the event an employee feels um, as if the policy has been violated, where can he or she go to seek redress, i.e., go to the state division, go to the EEOC. So now we need to advertise in our policies that uh, there are avenues for complaint outside the company, which is not something we've had to do um, in the past. Um, a unique requirement that we will now have to include language that says sexual harassment in and of itself is um, a form of employee misconduct for which uh, adverse action may be taken against the employee. And as your policies currently have now, uh, a strong statement against retaliation uh, for, against somebody who makes a complaint. Um, in addition to the policy, um, as I alluded to earlier, which you probably all know at this point, we are going to be required in New York State to conduct annual anti-harassment training, not just for your managers, not just for your supervisors, but for all of your employees. And the state in its legislation is coming out and saying, look, your training needs to include certain requirements. Number one, it must be interactive. Defining interactive um, is, not, um, is not set out yet, but um, this doesn't mean that you need to bring in somebody and they have to do live training. I think what it ultimately is going to mean is that it needs to be in a form in which employees can engage with an instructor, ask questions. Maybe that's during a live webinar. Um, certainly in person would work. Um, what I don't believe is going to be acceptable is having every employee pop in a CD and watch it when they come. 
Um, so it's going to need to be interactive. And I've always interpreted that as the ability for an employee or uh, for somebody watching it to ask a question and get an answer. Um, the state is uh, intending by October 9th to come out with a model uh, training program for employers to utilize. Uh, the uh, Department of Labor and the Division of Human Rights will once again uh, collaborate on that and prepare a document for us to review. It doesn't mean we have to use it, but certainly uh, will provide us with an indication as to what uh, the state expects it to look like. Um, this again will apply to all employees, uh, top down, bottom up. Um, and it will be an annual requirement. So, you know, year after year, we're going to be required to do this training. In terms of the time length, I don't know if it's an hour, an hour and a half, two hours. We have no um, information on how long the state expects this to be as of yet. Um, as I said, uh, it needs to be interactive. It needs to be annual. Included in the program will be an explanation of uh, what sexual harassment is, examples of it. Um, we are going to talk about the federal and state statutory provisions um, and, again, the right to redress uh, and also discuss the different forums in which people can bring claims. Sounds a lot like the policy uh, that you're going to have to implement. But this training is going to be required and failure to conduct the training with all employees ultimately will result in uh, sanctions brought by the state in the event it's uncovered. Um, Again, I encourage everybody on this call, yes, it's a mandate. Yes, you're going to need to uh, comply, but don't comply begrudgingly. Comply enthusiastically. See this as an opportunity for us to uh, take advantage, to go out, to educate, and to communicate, and do everything that we possibly can to have employees bring their complaints internal as opposed to external. Um, and I think we'll be very, very happy with the results, right? Because at the end of the day, a functioning company, uh, when you're dealing with EEO compliance, is one that encourages and facilitates uh, a significant amount of communication between its employees. The more communication on all topics that we can facilitate, the more likely it is that people will be happy in their workplace and the less likely it is that they're going to go outside the company um, to address any things that they think are, are wrong, um, for example, harassment or discrimination. Um, in the time that we have left, let's talk about uh, the New York City measures that are going into place. I will tell you that this was passed by the council, the New York City Council, on April 11th. As best as I'm aware, as of today, it's still not signed by um, Mayor de Blasio, but uh, every indication is that he will sign that shortly. Um, I should say, by the way, with New York State, um, we anticipate that the effective date of that law will be uh, at some point in November 2018. So the requirement to do annual training could very well kick in in this calendar year. Um, the New York City law, uh, some, to some extent, the training and the policy uh, requirements overlap with uh, New York State. But just some additional interesting requirements under the New York City law um, the websites uh, for both the uh, uh, or for the Commission on Human Rights uh, will include a lot more online materials for the public to review about uh, sexual harassment, um, descriptions of model complaint procedures, um, certainly descriptions of how you complain under the city law, um, and also feed information to employees about where they can go for help. Uh, in addition, New York is going to, uh, the New York City uh, requirement is going to in incorporate a poster requirement, and that poster must be hung uh, in every New York City workplace with 15 or more employees. It will need to be displayed in both English and Spanish, and it will be an information sheet on, you know, what employees can do, what sexual harassment is, and what employees can do in the event they believe uh, that they are subject to or a bystander of harassment in the workplace. Um, interesting, it'll also include requirements on size and style. So um, New York City is really, really getting into your workplaces with this one. Um, and we anticipate that will be a requirement about 120 days after uh, this becomes law. In terms of the training requirements, um, it's going to apply to all New York uh, city employers with 15 or more employees. 
unlike New York State, where we anticipate this going into effect in 2018, uh, the training requirements of the city um, uh, of the city mandate will not go into effect until uh, April of 2019. Um, similar to New York, um, the training is going to need to be interactive, and New York City did include uh, a definition or preliminary definition of what interactive means, which includes uh, the ability to ask questions. It is uh, the ability to have a trainer or trainee interaction. Now, who does it cover? Uh, it will cover uh, any employee who works 90 or more hours in a calendar year uh, in New York City, uh, and it will um, apply to, uh, you're going to have to have uh, new hires um, trained within 90 days um, of employment. The New York City law also included requirements on record keeping, uh, where an employee must sign an acknowledgement form uh, that they went through the training, uh, which again will be annual, and an employer must maintain it for uh, no less than three years. Uh, this can be maintained uh, electronically as well. The uh, training content, similar to New York State's requirements, you're going to have an explanation of sexual harassment, a statement of what sexual harassment is, and also uh, examples um, that are prevalent and popular uh, that we've seen. Uh, the New York City law is going to require some additional details, which include not only reference to who an employee can communicate with outside of the company EEOC, the city administrative agencies, the New York State, uh, but also include contact information, which is another, you know, more detailed, but a big change to what New York City employers probably have in their policies right now. It will include information about how to be an effective bystander, and so we need to train on that and additional responsibilities uh, that fall on supervisors and managers in terms of protecting the workplace from, uh, from uh, harassment. There will be overlap. New York City has already contemplated the fact that the New York City employers will have New York State obligations, and thus, in the event you comply or you meet the requirements of New York State, provided that you're meeting the distinctions of New York City, it's, uh, it, there'll be overlap and New York City will recognize the training that you're doing uh, for purposes of the state law. Uh, in addition, um, the, um, there are, uh, New York City is gonna come out with its own module on training, similar to New York State. We haven't seen any of this yet, but um, we should get some model materials uh, from New York City, similar to New York State. Uh, as always, we end where we begin. Uh, there are mandates. We need to know what those mandates are. We need to meet those mandates. But I encourage everybody listening to this program, embrace this. I encourage every employer to see the good in what these initiatives are and capitalize on them. Use them to make your workplaces better. As always, I'm available to you via email or phone. If you have any questions on this or anything else related to management side labor and employment, do not hesitate. Have a wonderful afternoon, wonderful weekend, and we'll see you next month. Thanks.